And it is seven, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, Great. My name is Jenny. I'm the president of the Silicon Valley Democratic Club. Welcome, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you, Kristen, for reminding us that this is recorded. Uh, we do record all of our meetings uh, to make available to our members who are unavailable to attend. We post on YouTube and share the link with them. Uh, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please, um, I just think I would mute yourself. Uh, our meetings are all open to the public. Uh, when we vote, we do require uh, uh, active membership. Um, so if you want to participate in voting with the club, uh, you do need to subscribe. Um, and you could, uh, maybe Jeff can put a, a link in the com uh, chat for us for that. But otherwise, everyone is, is welcome to attend and listen. And uh, we have a great agenda today. Um, let me see about sharing my screen if you'll bear with me for a second. And we'll post a link to this in the chat. Uh, we're going to start off with a uh, special guest, Dr. Melissa Michelson. She's going to give us a post-election analysis um, that will go for 20 minutes, followed by a 20-minute Q&A. So we're very, very excited to hear from her. Uh, then we have a brief uh, presentation from Reverend Jethro Moore from the Silicon Valley uh, NAACP. He is going to tell us a little bit about his experience in Georgia and why it's important that we do what we can in the Senate runoffs there. Uh, afterwards, we're going to vote for the executive board slate that we presented at last month's meeting. Uh, so this is an up or down vote on um, the proposed executive board uh, for next year. And finally, we're going to um, take a minute to uh, honor Bill Barrett, who is unfortunately leaving the board uh, this year. Uh, and we do want to recognize his service. So we can go ahead and jump right in with Dr. Michelson. Uh, she is the Dean of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Political Science at Menlo College. She's a nationally recognized expert on Latinx politics, voter mobilization experiments, and LGBTQ rights, and past president of the LGBT Caucus and of the Latino Caucus of the American Political Science Asso Association. She is the award-winning author of six books, including Mobilizing Inclusion, Transforming the Electorate Through Get Out the Vote Campaigns, and most recently, Transforming Prejudice, Identity, Fear, and Transgender Rights. Her work also appears in a variety of top-rated academic journals and in popular outlets, such as the Washington Post Monkey Cage blog. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Michelson. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks to my mom who I see showed up, which is awesome. So I have at least one friendly face. So I made some slides because I'm a professor and I, I, I need slides to talk. So, um, but obviously um, I'm happy to talk about anything that's not necessarily covered by what I prepared. So, I think we all have been spending quite a lot of time in the past couple of weeks trying to figure out exactly what just happened, um, why did we get a rejection of Trump and um, victory by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and yet not win more seats in the Senate, um, lose actually a bunch of seats in the House of Representatives um, so what is it that the voters are trying to tell us? What can we learn from state and local results here in California? And what exactly are, is the public thinking, assuming that they are making rational choices? I think you've probably seen quite a bit of analysis about what Latino and Black Americans were doing in this election, and particularly, particularly in terms of their support for the Republican incumbent. Um, and then finally, of course, it's never too early to start thinking about the next election. So we can talk a little bit about what this year's election results mean for the next presidential election. 
So I think the, the number one question on my mind, at least, is what the heck just happened? Because um, on, the, on the left, we have the electoral college vote and we have very clear victory by Joe Biden. And yet uh, on the right, and I think actually one more seat was decided after I made this slide this morning, um, Democrats lost seats in the House of Representatives and are only hanging on to their majority in the House by the narrowest of threads. Um, so that means that many voters were going into the voting booth and voting both for Joe Biden and for a local Republican for Congress, or that um, Demo some people were voting for Joe Biden and then skipping the congressional races. So what is it that the voters are trying to tell us when they're doing that? Um, and particularly, I, I think we're all a little bit concerned about what exactly happened in Maine where the voters of Maine decided to send Susan Collins back, but the state also went for Joe Biden. So um, it seems like people are deliberately choosing to split their tickets, right? So there's a couple of um, trends <laughs> that seem relevant, right? One is uh, that it does seem, if you look at the history of how federal elections are decided, that we do see the electorate flipping back and forth. They give the Republican party control of some of the elected branches, and then two years later, they switch it back. And there's no real consistent trend in terms of Democrats holding on to control in a unified way for more than a couple of years or, or Republicans keeping in control for more than a couple of years. And so it's almost as if the country is telling us we like gridlock. We want there to be this check on the control of the president. And so once we know who the president is two years later, we're gonna pull back on that. And that's consistent beyond the years that are shown here, right? That consistently in midterm elections, the president's party loses seats. So it does seem like in some ways the public is saying we like split party control. Um, so that might be just what's going on is that the public is saying even this year, we want split control. Yeah, we don't want Trump anymore, but we don't really want what Biden is selling. And so we're also gonna send some more Republicans to Congress. Um, it's not that people are switching parties, right? Um, it's not that the electorate is switching between more people identifying as Republican or more people identifying as Democratic. At the individual level, people have consistent partisan preferences for the most part throughout their life. And the split in the electorate in terms of what percentage of people prefer the Democratic Party or the Republican Party has been pretty consistent for the past couple of decades. So it's not that people are changing their partisan affiliation, you know, leaving the Republican Party, right, or anything like that. That's not what's going on. Um, Probably though, what's going on is that we have these enormous incumbency eff effects. We have increased polarization. And this year in particular, to some degree, we have a correction to the 2018 blue wave. So in 2016, much too many people's surprise, Trump wins the presidency and also sweeps in with Republican control of the House and the Senate. And two years later, there's a huge blue wave rejecting what he's been doing and saying, oh my gosh, no, we want Democrats, right? And you could argue that Democrats won a lot of seats two years ago that weren't really democratic seats, right? So they pick up the 40 seats, they have this huge gain um, in seats and there's a surge in participation where just over 50% of eligible voters go to the polls and tangent, that should disturb you that everyone was really excited that we hit 50% turnout in a midterm election. Um, but we had a uh, huge voter turnout um, and that swept in a whole bunch of Democrats. And so what you could say is that part of what happened two weeks ago 
is that some of those seats went back to the Republican Party, that they really never should have been Republican seats, but just there weren't enough Republicans voting and Democrats were very energized to vote two years ago. So yeah, we're gonna lose those seats, right? We're probably, um, we've lost a couple of seats in California. We're probably losing 21, we're probably losing 25, 48, right? We're losing these house seats that, you know, we narrowly won and that most of the voters there are actually Republicans. Um, another thing to keep in mind though, that I think, you know, if you're a member of the Democratic local club or if you're a political science professor, maybe you lose track of this. Um, most people just have no idea what's going on with congressional elections. They don't know who their house member is. They don't know which political party controls Congress. They really don't think about it, right? Um, and especially in a big presidential year when all the focus is on whether Trump is gonna win reelection or Joe Biden is gonna win, it drowns out almost all of the coverage of the congressional candidates. And so even when people are making the decision at home because they're voting by mail, but more so when they're going to the polls and voting, they just haven't really thought about it, right? And so you're coming out to vote for president um, or because you wanna say something ab about the presidential election and then, oh crap, I gotta vote for Congress now. And yeah, I recognize that person. That's my Congressman, right? It really matters a lot more than we might wanna think it does. Um, so here in California, of course, we are a very democratic state and we're here in this, this nice dark, uh, blue section of California here. And so Democrats are easily reelected, but of course there are many parts of California that tend more Republican. And so it makes sense that Republicans um, are holding onto those seats or even picking up seats right now. Um, so that's part of it. And part of it is just how big the incumbency effect is. Overwhelmingly, every cycle, most incumbents are easily reelected. Um, open seats are rare and challengers um, maybe have a shot in an open seat if somebody retires, but overwhelmingly in both house races and Senate races, um, incumbency is a huge advantage. And so um, many people are just gonna get reelected and it doesn't, it doesn't even really matter what's happening at the presidential level, right? So, um, so part of what is happening in terms of why is it that, you know, so many of these um, seats in the House and the Senate stayed safe, including Susan Collins, is because they are incumbents and people have affection for their existing members of Congress, their senators and their House members. And even if there's a big shift away from Trump or for Trump or for whoever at the presidential level, people aren't necessarily thinking that that means that they also have to send somebody from that same political party to Congress. Or if they're thinking about that at all, they might think, well, I'm gonna send somebody from the other party because I don't want too much of what Biden is selling, right? Um, so we have these corrections um, as I would call them here in California where it looks like um, Cox is going to lose in 21, Cisneros is going to lose in 39. Um, maybe Marcosia is going to hold out um, in California 25. But I want to bring your attention to this other um, trend, which I think is getting less attention and which I am very excited about. And maybe as members of the Democratic Club, you're paying more attention to this um, than my students. but. There's this other very interesting thing happening in local politics where young, very progressive Democrats, many of them endorsed by the socialists, many of them queer, getting elected. Um, James Coleman, who's a 21 year old college senior who happens to be living at home because um, of distance learning, just defeated um, 17 year incumbent to win a seat on the South San Francisco City Council. Um, Lisette Espinosa Garnica just beat out Janet Borgens to win a seat 
in Redwood City. Um, she's a non-binary Chicanx democratic socialist. Um, we've got Michael Smith, a, a gay black entrepreneur who won a seat on the Redwood City Council as well. Um, Alex Lee um, winning uh, the assembly seat, Antonio de Jesus Lopez winning in, in East Palo Alto. So we just have a lot of really progressive young people, many of them identifying as members of the LGBTQ community, winning seats here in, in Silicon Valley. And so I don't know that I have this really firmly figured out yet, but what here's what I think is maybe happening is that at the national level in places like Maine and, and Iowa and, and these other states, a lot of people are less enthusiastic about the progressive agenda. They're a little bit more worried about what it is that the Democratic Party has in store for them. And maybe they even identify as Republican, but they didn't want Trump. So they voted for Biden, but they don't really want that super progressive democratic agenda. They don't necessarily want the Green New Deal. They're not sure they want to forgive college debt. They, they don't want all of that. They, they have been scared by all the Facebook ads telling them that Biden is going to make America a socialist country. And so in the broader US, I think what's happening is that Democrats had a harder time winning congressional seats because of that concern about the Democratic Party going too far to the left. But meanwhile, here in Silicon Valley, we're like all in, right? We are electing these very liberal, very progressive people endorsed by the Democratic Socialists who, who want to do fairly radical things, right? Who are a more progressive arm of the party. And so it's, it's like the Democratic Party has to figure out where it's going. Right? Um, do you want to be the Democratic Party of James Coleman, of Lizette Espinosa Garnica, um, of AOC, the Green New Deal, um, fighting climate change, and um, you know, maybe expanding healthcare and, and all of those very progressive things? Or is the future of the Democratic Party more the moderate message that wins you seats in those upper Rust Belt states, right? Um, so I feel like we, here in California, we very much have um, that divided path for the Democrats in front of us with Silicon Valley going one way and these other areas of California and Central California and Southern California, maybe saying, well, that's not gonna work here and Democrats will lose. Right. Another thing that happened, of course, in 2020 is that people spent a crap load of money. Um, I personally sent money, you know, to Harrison and to um, to Iowa and, and to all of these Senate candidates that I thought were really um, going to turn the, the Senate solidly Democratic and it, it didn't work. Right. Um, all this money was spent um, and the incumbents won. So um, but we did break records. Uh, enormous amount of money was spent in the 2020 election. And this is um, just an estimate because of course the, the latest campaign finance reports have not yet been filed. And it matters because most of the time the person who spends the most money wins. Obviously that's not always true. Um, we have um, examples in California of very wealthy candidates trying to win. We have um, Mike Bloomberg trying to win the presidency uh, and Tom Steyer. Right, so, so spending doesn't always win races. And we know that in California as well from some gubernatorial and Senate races, but you do usually win when you spend the most money. And, and so it, it does matter that these races are becoming more and more expensive and, and so much money is being spent. Um, and that can help us understand what just happened as well. I'm more excited to talk to you about this. Um, so as you heard in the intro, this is more where my area of expertise is. I've actually been working for the past couple of cycles on getting out the black vote in addition to getting out the Latino vote. And there's a lot of interesting commentary that you might've heard about what exactly just happened with black and Latino voters and particularly 
among Black and Latino men, right? And there's definitely something going on, right? Um, the level of support for Joe Biden was much stronger among Latinas and among Black women compared to Latino men and Black men, right? So there's something that Black and Latino men were hearing that made them more willing to support Trump. And of course, all of the analyses are ongoing, but reports seem to suggest that they liked his, you know, his strong man stance, that they liked that uh, he was standing up for America, and that they liked that he was talking about jobs and talking about the economy and claiming that he was gonna fight for people's jobs and fight for America and help people support their families and keep America safe from, safe from socialism. And there was really quite a lot of information going out to communities of color about how Biden was going to make America like Venezuela, was gonna make America a socialist country. And that really resonated with uh, certain segments of the population, for example, uh, with Cuban Americans, which I'm sure you heard quite a lot about um, interestingly, we don't see the same split among Asian Pacific Islander Americans. But this is not just Trump, right? Um, black, ma black male support for the Democratic presidential candidate has been slipping uh, from a high of 95% for Barack Obama in 2008, down to only 80% this year, whereas uh, support for the Democratic presidential candidate among Black women has remained at 91% and higher, right? And so um, there's something going on here where black men are being pulled away from the Democratic Party and are seeing something that they like in the Republican Party. And more analyses are needed to figure out what it is that he's, that the Republican Party is saying to them um, that they like, but it's not just a Trump issue, right? This is something that's been happening for years. Whoops, 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 sorry. Um, I also wanna give you a little bit more insight into what's happening with the Latino vote and the Asian Pacific Islander vote. So you can see here that overall, uh, Latinos overwhelmingly did support the Democratic candidate, but that's not true among Cuban Americans, right? They they are um, more strongly support the, the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, but we shouldn't make too much of this, right? Most, Latino Americans in the United States are of Mexican descent. Um, only about 3% of Latinos in the United States are Cuban Americans. And of course, most of those are in Florida. And so now that it looks like Florida is not as important, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a bit, if Florida's, if Florida is not the, you know, make or break state that it's been in previous presidential elections, then we can stop obsessing about Cuban Americans, right? because they really only matter in Florida. And if Florida isn't the key swing state, then we don't have to worry about that one segment of Latinos that are so concerned about communism that they're always going to support the Republican candidate. Very similar thing going on with Asian Pacific Islander Americans. Overall, um, they much more strongly support the Democratic candidate than the Republican candidate, with the exception of Vietnamese Americans, who again, have a higher level of concern about communism because of their um, country of origin history with communism. Um, but of course, most Asian Americans in the United States are not Vietnamese, right? Um, and so in terms of the larger groups that are in the United States, we're talking about a pretty heavy inclination for the Democratic Party. Okay, <laughs> so What's next? Uh, some of us, of course, would like to look into our crystal ball and see a blue Texas. I think uh, many of us drank the Kool-Aid on that one, um, myself included. It seemed, it seemed so close. Um, I think we need to remember how fluid things are. Uh, some of you were alive and might remember what happened in 1968, where California was a safe democratic state, Texas was a safe, uh, Sorry, California was a safe Republican state. Texas was a safe Democratic state. This map always messes me up because the colors are reversed. But um, all, you know, things were very different just um, a few decades ago. 
Um, and then of course, um, we have to remember 1980 and um, four years later, um, these parts of the map were also red, right? When Reagan ran for reelection. So um, a map from one year doesn't necessarily predict what's gonna happen in the future, um, but we can look at what's been happening in recent years to try to get a hint of what's to come. So of course, just four years ago, uh, Georgia was red and Arizona was red and more importantly, these states were red. And that was really, as you all probably remember, that's where the election was lost by Hillary Clinton by these very narrow margins, especially in Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, so the question uh, coming into the 2020 election was, would those states go back to the Democratic Party or would they stay with the Republican Party? Was 2016 an anomaly or was it a sign that those states had now flipped and were now going to be uh, states that were gonna be winnable by, by Republicans? Um, by October, it seemed pretty clear that they would not um, and they were in the blue column, but of course we all um, were on pins and needles until the very last moment. And then as you can see here, Arizona went blue by October as well. And so there was a lot of, um, change in the map. Um, sorry, and one more, and Georgia going to be a swing state. So what happened between the beginning of the 2020 election when people were just starting to pay attention and later, uh, early on, Biden was seen as uh, fairly far to the left and Trump seen as pretty, pretty far to the right, given where people thought their, that an ideal candidate would be. And the Trump administration, uh, the Trump campaign's advertising was successful at portraying Biden as being more liberal, right? So circling back to what I was saying earlier, I think what explains what just happened is a lot of, Ameri a lot of American voters were convinced that Biden was much more liberal than they thought. And for some people, that was a good thing. They saw him listening to Bernie Sanders, um, you know, maybe changing his position on some issues and, and looking more progressive and they saw that as a good thing. But for many other voters who are maybe not members of the Silicon Valley Democratic Club, they saw that as moving Biden further away from somebody that they really wanted to be president. And so even if they didn't wanna vote for Trump, they were more nervous about voting for Biden because the advertising of the Trump campaign was portraying him as out of touch with America as too far to the left, as radical, right? As a Trojan horse, if you've seen that ad, a Trojan horse um, for the super liberals of the Democratic Party. And that I think would explain why some people would also then go in to vote and vote for Republican members of Congress and not give him that Democratic Congress that a lot of folks were hoping for. Um, so looking ahead to, to 2024, um, this is uh, my guess for what is gonna be happening as we uh, look at the election in four years. I think uh, Democrats have tasted blood in Texas and there will be a, a fight to turn Texas blue again. I think Arizona and Georgia have established themselves as, as swing states. And I'll think, I think we'll see a fight again for these upper Midwestern states maybe not so much Minnesota, but definitely Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And that I think that's where the fight is gonna be. And I think we can stop worrying about Florida. Um, I think uh, we just, sorry, Aunt Deva, we're just gonna have to leave Florida to its own devices. So uh, that's, my, that's my hot take. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I had fun putting the slides together and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about any of that or, or really anything else. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelson, for that uh, presentation. And if anybody has questions, if you could uh, raise your hand by um, clicking the participant button at the bottom of your screen, which will open a side panel and there is a raised hand option. Um, I'm gonna uh, start us off and ask you about polling. I have a, a couple of questions I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on. 
Um, first is uh, that, you know, a lot of people who are analyzing uh, polling data um, got it wrong. Um, and similar to what happened in 2016. Um, about uh, that, I kind of have, uh, there's been, I've heard two different kind of explanations, one sampling bias and the other, the idea of this like shy Trump voter. So people just not being honest with their responses to the poll. Um, so that is my first question, um, your impression of that. And then secondly, um, when you look at polling data, how do you assess whether or not this is reliable data? Uh, for example, after the election, I saw a lot of people um, focusing on exit polling. Um, I have a lot of questions about whether or not exit polling is reliable. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear how you interpret this type of data. Yeah, that that's a whole like seminar in itself, what exactly has been going wrong with the polling and when are they gonna fix it? Uh, especially given that all the pollsters assured us after 2016, oh, oh okay, we know what we did wrong. We, we're fixing it now. Um, and so, you know, I think we're all disappointed that they did not actually fix it. So I think there's a couple of things going on. Uh, one is that it is harder um, to be accurate in a poll if you're not sure who's gonna vote, right? So part of the art of polling is, you know, you, you poll some people and then you have to decide how to weight that poll in terms of who's actually gonna vote. So, you know, you know from your sample, like, okay, in my sample of the um, white suburban women who I managed to get on the phone, 60% of them said they're voting for Trump and 40% for Biden. But now you have to guess what percentage of white suburban women are gonna vote. So how do I weight that sample to look like the electorate? And when turnout is unusual, and this year it was unusual, it was the highest level of turnout in a presidential election in a century, then you are less able to model what the actual electorate is gonna look like. And so you know what your respondents told you, but you don't know how heavily to weight each of those people. So that is something that they screwed up. They all screwed it up in similar ways, which is, is disappointing, but I think it's legitimately harder when you're not sure how many people are gonna vote and when turnout is so unusual. So you can't just look back at previous years and say, well, this is what it was last time because this year it was so different. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the shy Trump voter, and I'm not sure that's quite right. Um, I don't know um, about you, but all the Trump supporters I know are quite proud of it, right? And not shy. And so that seems to um, belie the idea that people are unwilling to tell a pollster that they support Trump, given how willing people seem to be to tell you that they support Trump. Um, it might just be that there are fewer Trump supporters even bothering to answer the phone or to click on the, on the survey link, right? So it could be part of the um, erosion of trust in the media, an erosion of trust in institutions that seems to be affiliated with support for Trump. And so it could be that there just aren't a lot of Trump people even answering the poll, right? So not that they're answering the poll and, and saying that they're undecided, but that they're just not even taking the poll. And so that again, the pollsters are left with a sample that's biased in terms of who's actually voting. It's not really what I do, right? I don't really do polling, um, but I feel like Next time there's gonna be a lot less trust in the polls, right? Especially after all the Nates told us that they fixed it this time and then they hadn't fixed it. And I think we're like, okay, Nates, you know, we're not listening to anymore. Um, so it's maybe it's time we just stopped worrying about the polls and just did everything we could to win elections we, we wanna win, right? And I, I think you've all heard that, like just ignore the polls, get at every vote. Don't worry about it. Awesome, thank you. Um, Don? Unmute. 
uh, uh, excellent talk. Thanks very much for uh, all of that uh, useful uh, information and insight. So I got a very simple question. What would you recommend as an action plan for us to win back the Senate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one thing would be to get rid of some incumbents, right? Um, so, you know, just like uh, if there's a way to make it an open seat, right? So, for example, if a Republican could be encouraged to take an ambassadorship or a judgeship or to join the Biden administration and open up a seat, right? Um, so that um, there is not an incumbent still in that seat. I think that would do a lot. Um, I think we could um, work on uh, campaign finance reform and we could work on, um, you know, a new voting rights act so that it's easier for people to vote. But I think the number one problem is that people like incumbents and these senators that got reelected right? All the ones that you love to hate, they're all longtime incumbents. And, you know, unless they decide to move on, it's going to be really hard, right? We, we in California have our own incumbents that we keep electing, right? We are apparently going to keep reelecting Diane Feinstein um, until she chooses not to run again, despite everything, right? And voters in Maine are apparently going to keep electing Susan Collins, despite everything. And so, you know, uh, Trump was able to get Kennedy to resign from the Supreme Court through a couple little nudges. Maybe there's some, there's, maybe there's something that could entice some Republican senators to, to move out of those seats. Um, but honestly, I think it's, it's just extremely hard uh, to beat these folks um, if they keep choosing to run. So, you know, throwing money at them didn't seem to work, so. Thank you. All right, Adia. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I was thinking about historically marginalized and disenfranchised voters and how there's, you know, we're finally trying to get to them. And you did just mention the, uh, the Voting Rights Act. So that's a huge piece of it, getting that piece of legislation passed. But more specifically, um, how do we... How do we figure out what's going on with our electorate when really, you know, they always say like one vote, uh, every vote, uh, it's one person, one vote. As we're looking at this electoral system, it's really not that way. I was looking at how votes are weighted in the Midwest versus the coastal states. And there's very much a disproportionality about how much your vote weighs um, when it comes to the presidential elections. And so do you have any suggestions on not just getting historically marginalized groups voting, but how to actually make it, you know, one person, one vote? Do you see that happening in our lifetime? Uh, hmm. No, <laughs> I don't see us getting rid of the electoral college as, as much as it is a terrible, terrible system and undemocratic and and horrible. Um, yeah, I don't actually see much hope for that. I do think that there's hope for uh, gerrymandering reform. I see a lot of states adopting our idea of citizens or districting commissions. Um, so even if the Supreme Court decided to punt it and is not going to step in, I think uh, citizens are stepping in to, to fight back against gerrymandering. I think both political parties now have a, a better appreciation of how important that is. The Democratic Party is a little late to the game, but they're finally starting to focus on winning those state legislatures so that they can control the maps at least. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hate to be depressing, but I, I don't see the, the Electoral College getting replaced. Um, but I think you can use that outrage. So I think one of the reasons, for example, that we haven't seen um, a stronger effect of strict voter ID laws is what, when people feel like they're being disenfranchised, they're like, oh, hell no, right? 
when you take away voting places and you take away early voting and you say, okay, you want to vote, you got to wait in line 11 hours, people are like, okay, right? Like Michelle Obama said at the convention, I'm going to pack my comfy shoes and a breakfast and a lunch and I'm going to wait and I'm going to vote. And it, it makes people even more determined to have their vote and to and have their vote count when they feel like somebody's trying to stop them. And so I think that's the way to go is given that it's really hard to get rid of the electoral college, given that in some states there are these, these terrible rules in place. If you emphasize to people um, that this is what people are trying to do is trying to take away their vote. And then you help them overcome those obstacles either by feeding them when they're waiting in line or giving them rides to the polls or helping, you know, helping them get those voter IDs. Um, then you can energize people and feel like they're fighting back against, you know, injustice and, and corruption. So um, I feel like that's a better path. Like that's where to put energy instead of like fighting the electoral college, which isn't going to go anywhere. Like I just, I don't see that happening. Um, so yeah. Do you see any hope of uh, getting Fox News and Sinclair Broadcasting under control? I understand that there's the English now have some kind of a law that penalizes uh, major media outlets, the ones that really reach a lot of people, for telling lies to the public. And they have panels that are able to do that. I know even if you, yeah, but even if you did that, they'd just go somewhere else. They'd go to AO, uh, AOA, well, AONN, they'd go to, perhaps. right, they'd go to the different outlet, they'd go into the QAnon sites on the internet, like, wherever it is that they're going to hear the stuff that they trust, they'll go there. So if Fox News stops being a propaganda arm for the Republican Party, all those Trumpy Fox people will go somewhere else to get their news. We select the news that speaks to us. That's why none of you probably watch Fox News. But if you're a Fox viewer and somehow and suddenly Fox stops being Fox, you'll go somewhere else. And there are a really wacky outlets out there that you can get your news from that will tell you the things you want to hear. So um, don't be any good. And I actually think it is not as possible here because in the United States, unlike other countries, we have that First Amendment thing and freedom of the press thing. And so you probably um, stop them. Um, Michelle, you're muted. The conservative please. movement that's doing this or, or is it just the appeal of Donald Trump this time? Sorry, I don't understand. Did you did you call on me, I, Jenny? I got I couldn't hear. Uh, yeah. So um, Michelle, if you can go ahead next. Um, so I feel I wanted you to go back over some of the numbers um, that were split up by demographic group because after Clinton's loss, um, you know, the sort of conventional wisdom was men just wouldn't vote for her. And people made a big deal out of the, particularly the men of color mm -hmm. who did not vote for her in the same numbers that they had voted for Obama. And um, this was attributed to misogyny, which, you know, probably. And, um, but it looked to me, unless I, it just went by too fast, like they were none too crazy about Joe Biden either. Like there were similar, yeah. there was a similar gender gap among yeah. um, voters for Hillary and Biden, um, which I think is pretty interesting given all the relentless punditry that we were subjected to about how a woman couldn't win. And in fact, um, you know, many, many voters in the Democratic Party during the primary process, I think, um, were reluctant to select a woman during the primary because of all the punditry that had attributed Hillary's loss to that gender gap, particularly with men of color. 
So I was really astounded to see that it looked like in your slides, like Biden had a similar gap. So I wanted to get your reaction to that. And then I also um, sadly have been hearing about the crappiness of white women um, who apparently supported Trump at the sa same or similar level to what they did um, in 2016. Um, and, uh, but this is, I think, as to Jenny's question, based on exit polling, and um, we don't know how reliable that is, particularly because the voting was by mail and, you know, rather than catching people just as they're coming out, we're not getting that, we're getting, um, you know, even less reliable than normal exit polls. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on the gender gap question across all demographic groups, including white voters yeah. compared to 2016. Uh, yeah, I think in 2016, there were so many factors that led to Hillary's loss, right? Um, so it's hard to know how much of it was misogyny, how much of it was Comey, how much of it was Russians, how much, right? Hard to say. Not going what to the, Wisconsin. Right, right. Not many going things. to Michigan. Yeah, Robbie okay. Mook being dumb, yeah. There's quite a few things all right. that happened there. We're all, yes. we're all traumatized by 2016. Yes. I, you yeah. know, I had my white suffragette suit on and I cried through the commercial breaks, right? We're moving on from that. But what I think happened is a, I wanna say like 12 things at once. One thing is that what we saw in the primaries is that it wasn't just that Democrats wanted to have it be a man but that voters of color wanted it to be a white man. So it wasn't just that Democratic primary voters were worried that nominating a woman like Elizabeth Warren or, or Kamala or Gillibrand or any of the fabulous women who are running, it wasn't just that they were afraid that America wouldn't vote for a woman, they were afraid to nominate another person of color. So the, the fact that it ended up being Joe Biden um, and that all the leading candidates for a long time um, were white men, right? That was like this trauma from 2016 showing up and black voters wanted Joe Biden, right? Latino voters wanted Bernie Sanders. They weren't voting for um, Cory Booker or Kamala Harris or Julian Castro. They were voting for the old white dudes, partly because they liked what the old white dudes were promising and were saying, Thing, but partly because they're like, mm, this country's hella racist. And it's more important that we win than that we have somebody community be the president. And so we're not gonna nominate another black person. We're not gonna nominate a, a Latino. We gotta win this thing. Um, so I think it's, it's not just that white people were like saying, or, or that wasn't just gender thing, it was also a, a race thing. But it was like everyone in the Democratic Party being like, oh my God, we can't do that again. We have to vote for somebody who America will vote for, who Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and Pennsylvania will, will vote for. And so it's got to be this like not scary white dude. Uh, and it can't be the socialist, right? So that gets us Joe Biden. Um, but there's definitely misogyny. I mean, I, I've been teaching political science for more than 25 years and all that time presidents have been men, right? We've all been socialized to think that presidents are men. Like, oh my God, what would happen if a woman was on her period and you know she pressed the nuclear button, right? You can't have a woman be in charge. They're too emotional. They're too unstable. We've been socialized to think that. And even women, right? Even girls, when you tell them draw a president, they draw a dude, right? So if we teach our children that men are supposed to be president, and if we are all socialized to think that women can't be president, then that affects both men and women. So it, I guess I'm trying to say we shouldn't be surprised that it's not just um, men that support men being president, but it's also many women who will say, 
And you don't want a woman to be president. That's a terrible idea, right? We're a much uh, less feminist society than maybe we would like it to be. And white women in particular have always been the defenders of the patriarchy, um, have always been there um, defending um, the privilege of whiteness and the privilege of the patriarchy along with the men. And so you can't, that white women have been supporting the Republican party and have been supporting Trump is not like this anomaly. It is historically true that white women have been defenders of the system because it benefits them to be in a system where it's a white patriarchy. And I feel like I'm getting a little off into like, <laughs> No, that's true. It's just the one thing that I, maybe I asked too complicated or too multi-level a question, but I think the one thing that I was thinking about was that, that the same proportion of men and seem to have voted for men of color, seem to have voted for Trump in 2020 as voted for him in 2016. It is not that Hillary Clinton's uh, being female drove them away to Trump, it was that they are not Democrats um, because they did not also vote for Biden. You know, 20% of African-American men voted against Hillary Clinton and for Trump, 20% of African-American men voted against Joe Biden and for Trump. And it was not just that they wouldn't support a woman, it was that they, they have been lost to the Democratic Party. And that was of interest yeah. to me and yeah. also, you know, upsetting to me. What is the Democratic Party getting wrong? Why are we losing these voters that we should be winning? Well, should should we be winning them? Because if, yes. if they're not buying what we're selling. We should be uh, selling something else so that we can win different. these voters. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. it's. I mean, if you take the perspective of somebody from the black or Latino community, it's actually better for them if both political parties are fighting over them, right? If they're captured, right? So in political science, we would call um, mm. those people Amazing. captured, right? If you're captured and you're like a safe democratic demo demographic, then we don't have to do shit for you because you're, you're not gonna vote for the other guy. Why would you vote for them? You always vote for us and we don't have to do anything for you. But if there's a threat that, oh my God, they might vote for the other team, they might vote for the other party, then we got to give you something. Now you're not captured. Now you're a swing demographic. It's much more desirable to be a swing demographic. And so if what this does is wakes up the Democratic Party to say, we have to do more to- Right, that's what I'm asking. And, right. What are we not doing? What are we not doing? Yeah, but anyway, that's a longer conversation. Yeah. We'll let somebody else ask a and question. And I don't know what that- I don't know what the answer yeah. is, but I actually think it's it's to their benefit that now yeah, the that makes parties sense. feel like they have to fight for their vote. So maybe we'll get something to actually happen about, in, I don't know, racism and immigration and all the things. That'd be good. That'd be good. Okay. Well, we are out of time for oh, uh, this portion <laughs> of our agenda. Um, but if anyone wants to stay around, maybe we can continue the conversation later. Um, but we do need to move to the next item, uh, which is uh, Reverend Moore is going to tell us a little bit about his experience in Georgia and why we need to be supporting the Senate runoff out there. Yes, well, um, thank you for having me. And uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Levine for helping make the connection as well as Bill James that helped me make the connection with the uh, Georgia Democratic Party. Um, as you know, I sat through uh, several classes, uh, video Zoom classes to get training. And then we uh, boarded a plane and we flew down to Georgia and my station was, uh, my county was in Douglas or Henry County out in Douglasville. Um, it's very interesting. I went to a nice small quaint courthouse. They have a nice brand new courthouse and when I walked in and explained to them who I was and got my badge um, I was greeted with a warm smile and a welcome that I was coming there was approximately a thousand a, a thousand of us coming out of state into Georgia to help uh, 
the oversight or, or monitor the elections. Um, so I brought my sandwich to uh, go because we started to be there 10 to 7 in the morning and the sun hadn't came up. The moon was out. And when we arrived and as we opened up the doors, um, there was already a line forming that was out to the, uh, uh, the baseball fields. And, and the people were all, all upbeat. Um, it was cold at first, you know. <laughs> so, so then, as the sun went up, sun came up. By eight thirty, the line was gone, and and the people were moving, and and uh, the the poll inspectors that came by a couple of times to check on us and uh, see how everything was going. Um, I, I think my personality, being kind of cheerful and talking and giving people a hard time, you know, you could see the different families coming in with uh, different team gear on. So uh, you see somebody from Cleveland, you've seen people from Minnesota. So what I first would notice is a lot of the people coming in aren't actually from Georgia. They're from other parts of the country. And so they were coming in and uh, first time voters. Um, I met several first time voters, people voting for the first time. They were either 18 or they just had never participated in the process before. Uh, families coming out with their kids, teaching their kids how, how this is supposed to go. This is how this is, we're supposed to vote. Um, uh, then the poll monitors came in and said that I was being too friendly with the people on the inside. You know, you're not supposed to take pictures or nothing. So I couldn't take pictures on the inside, but I did get a few pictures of those on the outside. And, and the community showed up and voted. The school I was at in Douglasville was a predominantly Hispanic school. And what they were quick to point out to me was that the Hispanic population that is in Douglasville did not come out to vote because many of them did not feel safe to come out and vote because they are harassing and arresting those and questioning. So uh, very few Latinos came out. I think I sent you the paper. At my location, there was 280 people who voted uh, democratically and it was 132 that voted for the Republican Party. 10 voted for Jorston, Jorston I believe the name was, and two had write-in ballots. I had no uh, uh, real problems to speak of. I guess as I had gotten there so, so early in the morning, we started where I was sitting, where I put my chair in to monitor people coming in and out. Um, I became very I happened to become very friendly with the police because like the schools, the schools have police stationed or, or they're part of the school district. So a couple of the police were standing around and we were talking and. Uh, had one guy show up and make some comments about Kanye West. Or people should vote for Kanye as he was walking in. And then another guy pulled up about 25 yards away from me. Um, um, 25 yards away from me um, um, across the parking lot. And at first his chair wasn't pointed toward me. Then he turned his chair toward me. And um, we never had any, we never had any words or said anything, but he was, questioning people as they left in and out. And so we sat there and, and, and I had a good time. I mean, it, uh, fear quickly turned into joy. I guess you could feel from the people coming in that 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 um, uh, this thing was going to um, uh, definitely turn. Um, and I kept telling everybody, this, if the numbers are showing up across Fulton County, the way it was showing up at, at this house that, um, the Democrats are going to win. And now to the professor, Melissa, she said Arizona and, and Nevada and even Georgia and, and may possibly maybe even Texas, the more people that are moving out of the cities, I think, uh, into these other states are going to be more, give us more and more opportunities as Democrats to, to win bigger and larger pockets. Uh, in my travels, when I did travel around Georgia, um, as long as we stayed inside the 85 loop and um, and I cut through up to some parts of northern Georgia, you didn't even see a lot of trunk memorabilia in and, and, and the Fulton County area until you got outside of the area before you could even see it. So it is indeed they're in the um, they're out in the countryside, I guess, for me. But when you stay close to the uh, big industrial sites, there was um, there were no problems, and and I had no problems, and uh, we had no arguments. <laughs> um, uh, but it was a it was a good time, and, and to 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 feel to feel the joy, to 
see kids coming eight years old, seven year olds with their parents to the polls, to see a young girl who was just turning 18 coming out to vote for the first time or, or to talk to a man who had never participated in the process and decide that this one he was going to be in um, it was just it was just very special. And again, I, I owe it to uh, uh, Jeff Levine and, and, and Bill James for giving me the opportunity. Uh, and so when we ask um, what's next or, or, or where, where do we go, uh, we've had a moment to reflect on what we've accomplished in uh, this election. And, and we, have fought, that we fought hard. <laughs> there were a lot of organizations uh, and we were together. We've made history. Um, We've delivered historic wins across the country with this, you know. Um, black voters turned out in record numbers. The Delta Sigma Theta sorority, they showed up and they dropped off cases of water. Anybody wanted water. It was like a community moving in one direction to change this tide, you know. And, and so we had water to give to people. I've never been to a voting place where they gave you water, you know. i never been inside a voting place where the, where the people there were working and had pots cooking and food cooking. And I looked at my sandwich and said, you don't have to have that sandwich, eat with us. So it was a, a movement. So, so now we have to look at the United States Senate it's up for grab. And despite getting the presidential win, it's fate will decide on this Georgia Senate runoff elections taking place January 5th. And I asked about going back and talked about going back and and they've said, really, they don't they don't need so much the bodies to come back as they as they need the money to, I guess, run the ads because the, <laughs> the ads back there are horrific, are just terrible, you know. And and the, the way they portray and they go at each other, it was like um, uh, I've never I'm not, I'm not used to that. I'm from California, I guess, but um, we have a long way to go. And, and the way to go is not just to stop and sit on our laurels. And I know that some said they've sent money. Uh, we've all donated money like we've never donated before. And I know that your agenda, there were some places to get on to, to call back and, and encourage. Um, if we can get these two seats, we know it's going to make a great difference. So as a Democrat is across, and I think what, I'm going to say this, no, not to be offensive, but I've been out here. And to be part of the Democrats here, there's always this thing where we're fighting sometime within our own selves instead of going in one motion. And in there, the gravitas is to turn it blue and to, to, take, to make change happen. And everybody's going toward that change. Everybody's trying to make that change. Well, the vast majority of them, not everybody, but the vast majority of them. And, and as Professor Melissa said, um, I have two two friends, uh, one well, two friends. I'll just say that, and uh, one of them voted re Republican, and, and you know, we'll still be friends. But it was we've had some drag out arguments about it, right? But one of my close associates uh, has been a long time Republican, and he came to me and told me, Jeff, this is the first time I'm going to vote. Democratic. So at the same time, we had 20% or, or a lot of Black men, for whatever strange reason, that they decided to do what they did, that, that doesn't vote against their best, their best interest. At the same time, we're not talking about how many of those Republicans that were Black or, 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 or Republicans in period who have crossed over uh, uh, to get this man out of office. And now we have to try to keep that momentum going as I have encouraged the, uh, the, the young man that's back there in Georgia to, as a matter of fact, in front of his house now, he has an also sign, and he's also supporting Reverend uh, um, Warnock to, to get him elected. So there are pockets of Black Republicans that are coming out of that, depart that, 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 that party. And for me, um, the most damage has been done out of all this, I do believe, is... Uh, it's going to be to the Christian or the evangelical church when it's all said and done. The loss of youth, I don't think the church is going to recover from it anytime soon. And the hypocrisy and what the Republican Party and many of those uh, religious leaders have, have, have sw sown. So if we have a spot that we as Democrats can elevate or, or we can push 
is to look for those uh, former evangelicals or those Christians who are no longer going and begin to, to pull them over, as again, Professor Melissa pointed out, as, as the LBGTQ and, and that whole group of people. Now, um, these kids coming up that understand them as a, differently than what the old fashioned Democrats or Republicans do, we have a group there that we need, we must muster, we must feed, we must nurture, and we must uh, 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 do what we can to increase uh, supporting uh, supporting them to try to support our um, initiatives. And, and I just want to keep going, but but like it was the weirdest thing I told people when we were voting here in California, we were, uh, for us to be a democratic state and we're fighting between Prop 25, I said, that shows there's something wrong as a democracy, as a democratic state that we couldn't get this right running this state. So when we say what's wrong, let's look at the fact of how, when we control things, we're fighting over this issue when this should have been a no-brainer issue for us, you know? So, so when we ask these questions, we see them, but we now have to actually deal with what the answers are. So again, I want to thank you guys for allowing me to go. Uh, I would love to go again, but um, <laughs> I don't think my wife's too giddy about me going. And and uh, when the, uh, with the, um, going into the purple color now or purple stage and, and things are getting heated back there, but, um, to see the people of Georgia uh, dancing in the parking lot and um, coming in to vote with joy is uh, something I'll always remember that I was there when Georgia turned blue. And um, I think we're gonna see Nevada turn blue. And I think we're gonna see more of this in Arizona as more of us in California who can't afford to live here <laughs> began to move into Arizona and we began to move into Nevada and uh, you see the same thing in Texas as all the companies that say they're leaving, they're popping up in Texas and other places. You're going to see the population because part of the Black experience of the Black population is to move where the jobs are going. And so there's going to be a group that moves to these job markets. And um, I, wouldn't, I, I would think that we're going to keep. I think our greater concern is like Christianity, you know, here in, and here in America. Uh, they say that we need to stop worrying about sending even uh, evangelists over to other countries and start evangelizing in our own country. We're going to start seeing, we're going to have to do more inside of California to nourish the democratic principles here in California than we are going to have to worry about going to other states. But again, thank you for the time and, and, and the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much, Reverend Moore. Thanks for, for coming and, and sharing your experience out there. Um, we have uh, agreed as a board that um, supporting the uh, two Democratic candidates in the Georgia Senate Senate runoff is runoffs is a top priority right now. It's our opportunity to gain control of the Senate. Uh, we will be sending out uh, emails with ways that you can get involved remotely. Um, phone banking, text banking, letter writing, postcard writing. There's a there's a lot that we can do. Uh, donating, of course. Um, so please keep an eye out for those. Uh, I also want to just take a moment to thank Dr. Michelson again. I don't know if I gave you a proper uh, thank you. So I appreciate you coming out. Um, and with that, we will move on to the uh, business portion of the agenda, uh, which is to vote for the 2021 executive board slate. Um, would, would you like me to share the voter stuff now or do you want me to wait until after that? Uh, so we're just gonna, we're over time. So we're just gonna send it out by uh, email. Uh, maybe if you want to uh, post a link. Yeah, I just had a slide with a bunch of links just to let everyone know what's going on. Oh, sure. Why don't you throw that up while I'm pulling up the agenda but if we could just keep it to a minute. Oh yeah, no, it'll be quick. Okay, so let me get it on slide so it's big so people can see. Yeah, it's only one slide too. Um, <laughs> um, so I just put this together quickly. So um, there's three main things I just wanted to let people know about. Um, one is Stacey Abrams uh, Fair Fight organization. Um, through that, you can donate to the two um, candidates that are in runoffs for January. Um, there's also an organization called Ballot Rescue Team, and these links will go out um, in this email um, Jenny is referring to. Um, but what you can do is help to cure the Georgia votes 
So um, uh, what that means, you, you go online and you sign up for a time block and you actually call voters who like they didn't sign the back of the card or there's an address that's not complete or for whatever reason, um, the ballots are not being counted right now. So there are times you can sign up for, you know, tomorrow, like just immediately um, to call and help cure those votes. And then um, just finally, it, you know, right now, if you know people in Georgia, um, you know, you have family there, whatever, um, here's a link so they can register to vote. They have until December 7th to register um, to where they can still vote in the January runoff, even if they haven't, even if they didn't vote in the last election, even if they're not registered today, they have until December 7th. And then moving forward, we're gonna look at the Georgia Postcard Project and also Vote Forward, which is uh, postcard and letter writing. That's it, I think I was under a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, can I put in a plug for something in Georgia? Yeah, please. So as long as I'm here, I, I would like to plug the work that I've been doing with an organization called Black Girls Vote and we worked to get out the black vote in Detroit and Philadelphia for November 3rd. And we're gonna do Atlanta and Macon in uh, January. And if you wanna hear, if you wanna learn more about it and possibly donate, it's called Party at the Mailbox. Uh, you can just go to Party at the Mailbox online and you can check us out. Um, it's a fabulous organization, um, fabulous project run by Black Girls Vote, which is a black led organization um, that is doing amazing things. And I've been volunteering my time as a consultant for their work and we're gonna help win in Georgia. So, party at the mailbox. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, so uh, the next item on our agenda is a uh, vote for the executive board slate for 2021. Uh, the way our election for our exec executive board works is we um, submit candidates uh, in October. Uh, so the only candidates that um, that have uh, that were submitted were on this slate. I'll go ahead and share uh, my screen with our agenda on it. Um, this includes myself for president, uh, Kristen Rivers for vice president of operations, Frank Ponciano for vice president of outreach, Kristen Lynn for treasurer, Vinod Minan for reporting secretary, Michelle Dauber for uh, member at large, Brinder Aluwalia, uh, the rest are members at large, Pete Daly, Don Draper, Adia Hogue, Jeffrey Levine, Suzanne Montegi. Jeff Orloff, Fred Rayhauser, Alexia Warsham, Marlene Zapata, and Rosie Zapata. Um, so I'm gonna now make a motion to approve the slate for the executive board of 2021. Second. Michelle Dauber seconds. Uh, we will vote by poll. Uh, this is for uh, members of the club only, um, but the poll will appear for everyone. Jeff, if you wanna go ahead and launch the poll. And we'll leave the poll open for one minute for voting. Jenny, while people are voting, can I um, mention the ADEMS elections? Because um, the next time we meet the window to register to run will be closed. If you're interested in running for California State Party Delegate, um, I will send Jenny the link to put in the chat because I think the chat is disabled. Is it? Is it? So I can't put the link in. But um, if you would like to run for Assembly Delegate, the deadline to register to run for Assembly Delegate is December 15th. All voting for assembly delegates this year will be by mail and you have to register online to vote in the ADEM election, the end. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Um, we have two outgoing board members, uh, Shalom Merquat, our vice president, who we will 
very much miss. And Bill Barrett, who is a longtime um, board member. And uh, with his leaving, we would like to give him an award uh, for his distinguished service. And I will hand it over to Fred if he is um, here to uh, say a few words. Fred? Well, I know Bill for 10 years, R around that. And, uh, and I've seen him very active in a couple clubs. I uh, met him at Move to Men when that was very, very active. And uh, I moved to the California, uh, to the Silicon Valley Democratic Party and Bill was right after me. And uh, when, and he uh, was uh, very active in, in the Move to Amend. He was like the uh, club historian. He knew all, everything that was happening in the uh, Move to Amend type of uh, uh, circles. Uh, when uh, Herb Engstrom, who was a longtime treasurer of the Silicon, the forerunner of the Silicon Valley Democratic Club said he was, uh, wanted to retire, Bill stepped up very, very, uh, uh, stepped up and uh, uh, took over with almost no hiccup at all. He doesn't have a I don't think you have a financial background per se. Uh, you were a, a professor of engineering at San Jose State, and but he picked up everything very quickly and uh, kept the books very uh, well. And he was tremendously responsive. Uh, when we were going and doing a lot more uh, fundraising and uh, advertising and uh, uh, Bill was always there. He always had a check ready for us. He always was uh, 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 very, very, very helpful. He was a, a very, very good, very uh, accommodating treasurer. He introduced Square into our uh, into our co uh, collection system. So you just basically had to have a a uh, credit card and he could, he could swipe it and put it right into the system and was very, very good. He was very progressive, very helpful, and uh, as well as a source of knowledge for things in the Democratic Party. We're going to miss him very much, uh, particularly the people that worked with him for, for many years are going to miss him very much because he was a great resource. Uh, he deserved this uh, Distinguished Service Award. Thank you. Fred, do you want to read the, or is someone going to read the letter? Uh, I don't have a copy of the letter with me. Oh, I have it in front of me. Should I read it? Or you maybe Jeff? Okay, I can read it. Okay. Um, so Bill, uh, we're so proud to give you the Distinguished Service Award from the Silicon Valley Democratic Club. This award pays tribute to the outstanding contribution that Bill Barrett has made to the SVDC and its predecessor club, the Santa Clara County Democratic Club, over the last several years. As a lifelong Democrat, Bill has provided wisdom and advice to the club during his tenure as treasurer of the club. He brought to the club the vigor of a young man and the perspective of a seasoned veteran. As a retired professor of engineering at San Jose State University, Bill had the experience of working in a complex working environment with multiple functions, making him well suited to a variety of roles within the club. When the club needed a new club treasurer, Bill stepped up and performed the function without any hesitation and ran an exceptional treasury. Bill was always available to meet the club needs and expenses, gave us accurate reports and most important, was always available to meet tight deadlines without hesitation. He made collecting money easy and user-friendly and was quick, quick to reimburse for legitimate expenses. Reports are always ready and warnings were given when we were running low on funds. He kept a disciplined set of books. More important, Bill was the sage of the club and provided insight and guidance to the club initiatives and direction. He gave his support to new initiatives and backed them with proper caution and good advice. 
We were lucky to have Bill for his dedication, diligence, care, and providing the pulse to keep the club functioning. Thank you, Bill, and good luck on your next challenge. We do miss you already. Um, so uh, we're uh, so proud to be able to give you this award. And of course, if we were meeting in person, we would be having a party right now um, with a cake. And I'm sorry that we can't do that. Um, I, I really wish we could. Um, and I have a plaque for you that is on order, but I haven't yet received it. Probably got slowed down by COVID as well. But um, as soon as I receive it, I'll send it to you by FedEx. And um, it just makes me very sad that we can't all celebrate this together today in person, but we miss you, Bill. And we also hope that you'll still swing by the executive board meetings when you have some free time. <laughs> Um, so thank you. Uh, and I do see uh, Omar Torres has had um, his hand up. I missed it earlier. I'm guessing this is related to mm -hmm. the uh, vote for the executive board. Um, Omar, did you have a, a question or comment? Hi, no, I just, uh, Michelle alluded to it. I just, I wanted to just jump on and inform folks that I will be actually having a region seven meeting devoted to the ADEM elections. Since uh, there's a lot of uh, movement on it uh, and it's very, very fluid. Uh, and so I, I just wanna announce to everybody that it's gonna be November 30th at 6.30 PM via Zoom, of course. Uh, and so uh, many of you may or may not know me, but uh, I recently ran for San Jose City Evergreen uh, which I won, thank you. Um, but I'm also your Region 7 director and just uh, going around making sure uh, that folks are prepared for ADEMS. So a um, lot, lot of things going on, especially post-election. Hopefully, you know, we win Georgia and all that good stuff, but we also have our, our own party and issues to take care of uh, at this critical moment. So uh, November 30th, 6.30 p.m. I will email you, Jenny, so you can send it to folks. Um, but I believe that Michelle also was going to send you the link to sign up because uh, for you to vote uh, for the ADEMS, you actually have to be pre-registered uh, to vote for the ADEMS. Again, it's, it's moving. It's, it's, there's a lot of movements. But um, as of now, uh, if you do not register by a certain date, then you, can't, you won't be able to vote um, even for the ADEMS. So I can send uh, that link. Uh, to Jenny and as well as my RSVP link for the Region 7 meeting I'll be having in a couple of weeks. So uh, and, I hope everybody Omar, has a, ahead, I hope everybody has a, a safe and healthy uh, Thanksgiving. Now more than ever, it's time to do our Thanksgiving gatherings via Zoom. As you saw, there's gonna, there's an uptick and increase of a, I should say, surge of cases of COVID-19. So um, hopefully everybody is safe. Omar, congratulations on your um, victory. Um, in your Thank election, you. and um, Thank you. I uh, uh, I was happy to see that. I am um, uh, on the ADEMS. I believe that the rules committee intended to. I think that the where we left it was that we were going to extend the registration deadline, just but just by a couple days. So I think people yeah. are going to still have to get registered. Um, you know, uh, I think. Maybe it's, uh, I can't remember the actual date and I don't want to give the wrong one, but um, you can register as of now because I just yes. logged in and registered during this meeting yes. to see if it worked. So did I. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can I also- I want to vote in my own <laughs> Yes, and you can so also- <laughs> You can also register to run, but that, um, I think the deadline is December the 10th. So anyone who wants more information about what ADEM is, which is a delegate to our state party um, or how to run um, or how it's gonna work, attend the November 20th meeting that Omar just um, referred to. November 30th. 30th, sorry, 30th, yes. sorry. No, that's okay. Yes, so and, and, sorry. And Michelle, thank you so much for pushing. Uh, I don't wanna take too much of your um, time uh, the club's time, but uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for pushing for for all VBM. Uh, I don't know if folks knew, but the, the party was pushing for a voting center, an in-person 
drive through or uh, satellite or, you know, BBM box, uh, but in person. And uh, that, that was just too risky. And, and uh, we're not that we're, we're the party of uh, safety and health and, and peace. And so uh, thank you for pushing that on the rules. It was really surprising to me how hard I had to fight. I mean, I thought it was kind of shocking. I would. Very. <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was like, well, 16 of the regional directors just said they don't want this. So like and like a bunch of them are going to be under snow. Like it was very surprising to me. Out of 20, pushback. by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was really 20, which is most of them. It was really surprising to me how hard I had to. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that. The, for your um, service. I know and it wrecked my day. So, I mean. <laughs> The rules committee is really <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Sign up, be on the rules committee. So yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. so, uh, well, so thank, thank you. you, Omar. Yeah. Thank you, no, Michelle. Thank you. thank you, Omar, for taking the time to come out. We're one of, I think, 23 clubs. And so uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking time to visit and, and share that important information. Yep. And, Jumping and back Omar, onto the young Dems. Wait, Omar, can I ask you a quick question first? Yes. Um, so I, I think that I'm actually not in region seven. Can we, can we, I'm still in Santa Clara County it, on that website that you're going to send the link to, can we confirm which region we're in? Um, on, on that website, not entirely, but, um, I, I think you're trying to allude that, um, uh, most of my region seven meetings are actually for everybody. Uh, I think most folks have known that uh, everybody and anybody is welcome to my Region 7 meetings. But um, but, but I mean, for is, registering is, and potentially running, you don't need to, to know. Right region, yeah, right? you don't you, need to know. You do no, no it, need to it, know. It, it's no. split into assembly districts. And once you type in your address, it, it'll tell you what assembly district you're in. Um, okay. But I mean, I, I know there, after an election, there's a lot of new activists and I can always come back and do the ins and outs of the CDP because we would be here for days. <laughs> That's an entire. Okay. Yeah, we should. Okay, actually, meeting. actually, <laughs> actually, Omar, I'll email you because I think yeah. we should do that. Um, yeah. I think I'm chairing the program committee this um, year. And so maybe we'll get you here in um, January oh, yeah. or February meeting to talk. That's about, its own meeting. <laughs> um, yeah. To talk about how to get involved in the party. OK, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. I'll, okay. I'll um, text you. you. OK, bye. Yeah. Thank you. Um, bye. All right, and with that, our uh, meeting is adjourned. If you'd like to stay um, and continue the conversation, you're, you're welcome to.